Even though I'm not a churchgoer myself, I love churches, and I was delighted to be asked to join the people of Low Ham on the edge of the Somerset Levels for their harvest festival to celebrate the end of the farming year. This church is one of my favourites, and from here it looks like any other church. And welcome to our harvest even song. But when we get outside, we can see that there are some very strange things about this church. It doesn't have a churchyard around it, no churchyard wall. Until very recently, there wasn't even a road or a path up to it. It just sits in the middle of fields. In this programme, we're going to, with the help of the local people, look at this church and hopefully come up with the interesting story of why it looks like it does today. Let's introduce you to a few of the locals who live here and work the fields around this church. There's the farmer, Owen Cook, and his brothers, and their families and the neighbours, and Karen, Owen's wife, who is particularly interested in the history of the place. And finally, there's Mrs Cook, Owen's mother, who remembers the Cooks coming here lock, stock and barrel. The Cooks came here in 1912 when my husband was only two years old. They hired a train to come from South Moulton and bring all the cattle, sheep, horses. They came to Langford West Station, where everything had to be unloaded and walked out to Lowham. I'm just on my way to see Karen, the farmer's wife here, and she's going to show me around the farm buildings. She, sh she should be expecting me. OK, Hello. then, Karen. <laughs> Can you show me around? Yeah, I just got my coat. OK. Is the dog coming as well? Looks like it, yeah. <laughs> I should go in, it's cold out here. Mickey, are you in all right? In all right. <laughs> the in, wise. <laughs> <laughs> this, of course, is why I really came here all those years ago, to see these bumps and lumps. At the time, I thought they might be a deserted village site. These are some of the main farm buildings. All those years ago, I published a paper about Low Ham, and at the time, from my brief survey of the buildings, I thought they were late 17th century. But now I'm not so sure. It looks much more to me as if it's uh, some good quality doorways and windows that they've just incorporated mm. in the later building. And this is even more so here, isn't it, with this doorway? Yes. Which they've just put the lintel in, basically, and they haven't got the sides at all. There's an interesting doorway inside, oh, at the top of these wooden steps. Oh, yes. Oh, that's good, isn't it, with the studs in it? That looks like a 17th century doorway. I'd, I'd guess they've moved the whole thing in mm. with the frame as well. It all rather suggests that they've reused these doorways and lintels from other buildings yes. when they put this building up, which is probably a lot later. Well, these are two of the orchards. This here is the walled orchard, which has got quite a high wall all the way yeah, around that's, it. That's very impressive, isn't it? That's, that's very like that big wall up the hill, which seems to be uh, sort of 17th or uh, 18th century. And this monumental wall running up the hillside clearly cuts across these earthwork terraces, which we can see running through here, uh, suggesting that they're of an even earlier date. Is there any other evidence to go with the 17th century remains? I visited Somerset Record Office. Well, we've walked around the, the farm buildings with Karen, and, and we can actually see them on this map. There's a load of walls and buildings here. And this map, actually, of 1779 is the map that got me interested in, in Loham to begin with, because it's very detailed for this date. The main thing is it shows this huge house sitting right next to the church. It's this big house that's gone. So already we have the grand house that disappeared, the large 17th century walls, and reused masonry. But around the church, we can find evidence of much earlier activity and it's the Cooks, through their farming, who found it. The Cooks have always kept sheep, and it's sheep that move our story on. Bert Bowne, farm worker. I came to work for Mrs. Cook and Sons in 1936. I worked for them for 25 years, 
And in the olden days, if farmers had a sheep die, they used to leave it uh, for a couple of days, pluck the wool off, dig a hole and bury it. Whilst Herbert Cook was doing that on this very spot, he dug up a tile. And this is the actual tile that Herb Cook found in 1937. It's actually got it written on the back. And he brought this into the museum, and it was a good job he did, because the comb marks on this tile show us that it was part of a hypercoarse heating flue system. It belongs to a tile, in fact, that looked like this originally. It was used to convey the hot air up through the walls of a Roman villa. And that's what Herb's tile indicates, a Roman villa. This one's actually quite a nice example because it's got the finger mark of the maker on it and nothing gets us closer to the original people. But if Herb hadn't have brought this one into the museum at Taunton, things would have been very different. During the Second World War, we were told or ordered to plough up a field. This was the middle field of five. My husband refused to do this, but did an acreage similar on another part of the farm. If we had ploughed that field, we would have ruptured a lot of the Roman villa that was found later. After the escape at the hand of the plough, the villa site to the east of the church was excavated. Bob Scriven. I worked on the Roman villa after the Second World War. It was very exciting, but all we were allowed to use the dustpan and brush and small trowel. And it wasn't just any old Roman villa. Molly Cullen. One of my earliest impressions as a child was seeing the vast number of cars parked in the field by the church and the tremendous number of people walking across the fields towards the Roman remains. A few years later, I was privileged to actually see the mosaic being lifted. And where is this wonderful floor mosaic now? Steve Minnick, Taunton Museum. So, uh, why is it on the wall, Steve? It, it's on the wall because we're dealing with a mosaic of quite a substantial size. And so we've got the room, I suppose, no, to put it on the floor no, anyway. That, that's right. Yeah. So we've put it on a, a, an end wall. Perhaps more importantly, why does it appear to be upside down? It was in the bath block. You came at it from what is, in effect, the bottom of the mosaic as it stands here. So you would have seen the main panels. Right. You would walk right. across, and at the top end, there was a cold plunge bath. Yeah. And yeah. so as you left that, you would have got the, the images from the other side. Yeah. So we would have needed a cold plunge bath by then, wouldn't you? I think you're With right. those two scenes right. on there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, as far as I'm aware, unique, as far as mosaics in Britain is concerned, in that yeah. it tells a narrative. It tells the story of Aeneas and Dido. Aeneas was present at Troy when it fell to the Greeks. He'd been given the job of founding Rome and yeah. fled with his followers. On the way there, they're blown off course, and the ships depict their arrival at Carthage. The front ship has somebody handing over a, a gold talk, ah, right, which yes. is a present to Queen Dido, yeah, Queen yeah. Carthage. The bottom panel shows the main characters. On the left, we've got Aeneas. Yeah, yeah. On the right, we've got Queen Dido. Yeah. The small figure is actually Cupid, who's in yeah. disguise here. Yeah. And the totally naked female figure is actually Venus, right. who rather right. complicatedly is also Aeneas's mother. God, it's true. <laughs> Venus decides that it would be a good idea to bring about a love affair between Aeneas and Dido. Yeah. And the affair reaches its um, consummation, really, during the course of a hunt. There's a great storm, and everybody scatters to take cover. And lo and behold, Aeneas and Dido end up alone in storm-tossed trees and in each yeah. other's arms. Aeneas receives several reminders from the gods that he's supposed to be doing things other than lurking in Carthage. <laughs> Dido, on the other hand, is utterly and totally distraught that he has left and actually commits suicide using, unfortunately, a sword that Aeneas had given her as a present, <laughs> as the uh, implement. So it's really a story about luxury and opulence and, and uh, good living and, and sex, of course. I, I think you could probably view it as one of the most famous one-night stands in classical <laughs> history, which had a very, very sad ending. Yes, yes. Perhaps we could. <laughs> The excavated part of the villa wasn't the only Roman find from the fields. Herbert Cook and I was rabbiting in this very field 
Herbert said there's something peculiar there. Then there was a round ring, all dry grass and that. We dug down there and we found an iron lid. And we lifted the lid and there was a well. This is interesting, Karen, the local archaeologist, writing about things found in the well. Pinus pinea, sacred stone pine, imported. These are these pine cones that they used to use for burning on altars to give the, the smoke and so on. Two cones found. We've got one of them in a glass case. I can get it for you if you like. Oh, yes, please, if you could. Okay, yeah. I'll just make the yeah. tea. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> make the tea first. There's all sorts of stuff here. Fruit stones, lots of shells of walnut. Now, if I put the case oh, here... Oh, crikey, hang on. That's fine. Right. You need to When move you the said book. you were going to fetch the pine cone, I... Ah, uh, no, this is uh, all, <laughs> the, uh, all the effects. And this opens down, so... We can take the front off, can we? It will lift, it will fall down. There you are. Oh, right. Good okay. Lord. Oh, yes, that. Good Lord, look at There's that. There's only one. Yeah, well, the other one's presumably in the museum or somewhere, is it? Oh, it's got a spindle wheel underneath it, look. They're a lot bigger than our cones, aren't they? Oh, yes, oh, yeah. Oh, that's extraordinary. This find from the well suggests the site was also an important religious centre. I suppose they lost the buckets down the well. It's great, though. Look, flattened bit for your hand. Top like that. Well, these are obviously bits of the mosaic floors that were found, except that some of this is, is wall plaster as well. We found a lot of loose mosaic over in the outbuildings. What do you mean recently? Yes, you... just well, the other week when we were sorting oh, out. Right, right. Have you got those? Yes, you? would you like to see oh, them? Yeah, if you can. <laughs> Get them. No, I've got my tea. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, crikey. Yes, there's quite a few bits. They're quite big pieces, too. Bit of a lucky dip. That one's got some orangey red. Oh, that's actually got us beginnings of a pattern on it, hasn't it? We ought to think, really, of this being a house rather like a stately home. You know, we think of these big grand houses from the 18th and 19th century. This is the Roman equivalent. It wouldn't have stood in isolation. It would have had gardens and grounds around it, may even have had a park around it, as well as farmland. So it's going to look something like a stately mansion. And the Roman villa wasn't the only stately home with gardens in the field at Loham. It looks like people have been using these fields for leisure and pleasure, as well as work, through the ages. In this church, there are monuments to two important local families, the Hexts and the Stoles. The Hects came to Loham first. They arrived in 1588, rebuilt the existing manor house in 1592, and then rebuilt this church in 1620. And that's why this church has never had a graveyard and churchyard wall. In essence, it's a private chapel as opposed to a parish church for the Hexts. They were followed by the Stoles. When the Stoles came to Loham, John, the second Lord Stoll, destroyed the earlier Hex mansion. We know the rough location of the Stoll mansion from the 1779 map, but where on earth was the earlier Hex mansion? We're standing on a hill here above the church, and it's called Hext Hill. But what clinched it for me was a couple of air pictures which clearly show the parch marks of buildings. That is, there's buildings there and the grass has died above them. And if you actually come out here, you can see that there are earthworks all over the place of these buildings. So here, for example, there's a building running off in this direction. Here's the corner of it. This looked the likely site for the Hex Mansion. I plumped for this in my paper in, in the 1970s. And the other aspect which helps, I think, is that this is on a totally different alignment. It's running down the hill in that direction at an angle to the wall which has got the other earthworks inside it. And the different alignments suggested to me this was an earlier phase of the site to the later developments taking place over in that direction. But what of the later Stowell Mansion? We have a description of this house because one of the first things we'd always do in Somerset is go and look at Collinson, which is the history of Somersetshire. And here in volume three, under the entry for Highham, 
we have a description of Low Ham, and this is in 1791. And here it says, uh, John Lord Stoll, son of this Rolf, pulled down a great part of the old seat built by Sir Edward Hext, and began a most sumptuous and expensive edifice, in which three state rooms at the south end were finished in the most elegant style, the ceilings decorated with very superb paintings. The whole he did not live to see complete, although it cost him upwards of £100,000 to raise which sum most of the estate, which was very great, was sold by his trustees, who thought proper to let this monstrous fabric run to ruin, in which state it has ever since continued. How did this sorry state of affairs come about? Karen Cook might have the answer in the form of the legend of the Lowham fiddler, who was asked to play at a sumptuous Christmas ball. Fiddler played and the revellers begged for more, and the more exhausted he became, the noisier and livelier they became. The liveliest and noisiest of all was Lord Stall. Finally, the host took the fiddler to a golden bedroom, which had a strange and sinister smell, and as the fiddler touched the bed, it burnt his hand. Then the gentleman said, this bed awaits Lord Stall, whose sins are many. And as the fiddler stared at the floor in terror, he noticed that the gentleman had cloven hooves. Well, that's what happens if you have too much of a good time. Lord Stoll was dead by the age of 24, leaving a reputation as a revelous sinner and spendthrift, which has passed into local legend. Over the last few months, more work has been done here on the hex and stole phases of the earthworks, which are all that's left of the ostentatious mansions with their elaborate and ornamental gardens. Every now and again, you get a new face in archaeology who comes along and challenges some of your work. Rob Wilson North is such a face. He has just completed a new survey of Lowham. Let's see what this young gun has to offer. How have you got on then, Rob? Well, here it is. Oh, brilliant. We think that most of the earthworks on this alignment are to do with late 16th, early 17th century phase, the hexed phase. The hexed phase, side. yeah. And we think that the house that goes with that sits somewhere up here on the top of the hill. Right, but not, not really where I had it up, up, up in the corner there. That's right, I think you'd, you'd put it in this area here. Yeah. And we tend to think these earthworks are not the site of a great house. They're something else. They might be, they might be service accommodation. Right. Um, Farm buildings or that something sort like of that. Thing. That yeah. sort of thing, yeah. 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 I think the other piece of evidence for putting the house up here is the position of the church. The church at the bottom. Really functions as a garden ornament more than anything yeah. else. Um, lies at the end of a, a broad vista that runs up through the middle of this field. Right, so we'd um, expect the house to the be house at the, at the other, other end, end of it. Perhaps. Right. Absolutely. So Absolutely. what does that tell us about these earthworks here? Because I thought this was an earlier phase of gardens coming down this way, because it's at a different angle. I think these are largely agricultural out here, but one or two yeah. of them may well be earlier. Um, for example, this, this feature here runs out into the next field and seems to relate to the villa complex, the Roman villa. Oh, right, so we might actually have bits of an earlier landscape yes, showing yes. through that. That's very good, yes, isn't it? That's so yes. exciting, if that's the case. So according to Rob's survey, the hexed phase is predominantly on this alignment, which I had associated with the later stall phase. Where is the evidence in the earthworks for the stall phase, then? So what happens then? I mean, these terraces are clearly cut through, aren't they? Yes, the, the, the big wall that runs up the side of this field cuts through the earthworks, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. And I think the reason for that is that this wall is part of the Stowell phase of the gardens. Right. And right. I think what, what happened in, in the 1690s when Stowell came to Lowham was that he inherited a, a perfectly adequate existing garden complex. Yeah. Yeah. And rather than start from scratch, he actually intended to rework the gardens. Right. So what we've, what we've got is um, a nice piece of evidence that, that supports us in that, and it's a letter from the 1690s. We've converted the, the measurements that were given in it yeah, yeah. into metric, yeah. and we found that they fit very well ah, with the earthworks. across that particular yeah. block, isn't That's it? That's right. And certainly the overall, this, this big wall is the overall sort of length of the garden. Corresponds very well with that letter. Right. Of course, the problem with yeah, the style mm -hmm. phase is that yeah. it was unfinished, so we don't quite know what the original, what the eventual intention was right. there. Right. But we know they were reworking this section, yeah. and they seem to have been doing it very much in terms of reworking the earlier earthworks. Yeah. Well, we're obviously not going to fall out too much about that, then, are we? We've, there's a lot of new and interesting stuff coming out of that.
That's right. Great. But where was the actual location of the house? And what did it look like? The 18th century map suggests that the Stowell Mansion somewhere around here. Yes, we think the house was over behind the bales here. Right. Um, in fact, if we oh, have got a the look map there, yes, yeah. this is an extract from that map of 1779. Oh yes, it would have been sort of immediately yes. the back of the church. This is this is the only representation we have of the house. I Are mean, you happy and with that? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> uh, we think it's um, the, the, the surveyor's imagination, if you like. It, it gives us a, r a rough position, but it doesn't actually pin it down on the ground for us. Right. Um, but by carrying out the survey, we've actually been able to pin down its precise site and actually to identify one or two pieces of, of masonry that appear to be still oh, in situ right. from I, the original house. I mean, I'd assume there was nothing left no, at all. There, there are one or two bits oh, left, oh, yeah. Can, can we have a look at yes, that? Yes, we're going to have okay, a look. Yeah. It's not only archaeologists who discover the exact locations of disappeared mansions. The cooks used to keep a large Devon bowl and used to keep it in a place called Bowls Court. And one morning, Herbert Cook said to me, will you come with me on Bulls Court? The bull has fallen through the floor. And I laughed. So we came out, looked through the gate there, and there was a bull that had fallen through there, and it was looking at us. So we got down, put a wagon line around his head, four or five of us pulled out. We noticed that it was full of water, and Eventually, Herbert and I got in, in a, on a, with a boat, and he had his torch, and he looked, shone it all the way around, and in the eastern wall, we found crevices where we think they might have stacked burrows, and we think it may have been an underground cellar. We've got uh, three half columns oh, that's here. that's good, isn't it? Yes, they're wonderful. Yeah. They're actually yeah. three of them. One, second Two. one there. The best oh, one over one here. in the corner. God, yes. So I think we're, what we're getting is half columns, probably supporting the basement floor of right. the house. So right. we're actually in the cellars down here. Well, why didn't I see that? I oh, mind you, I never came round and paddled through this lot. That's probably the reason. I mean, we're talking about an area 27 metres wide and about 60 metres long. That's a hell of a lot bigger than I thought it was. I think what we have to remember here is that the Stowell um, was incredibly wealthy yeah. and that whatever he was building would, would have been state of the art. Right. So I think that in term, in, and high fashion, so I think in terms of, of reconstructions, we could look at other, other houses around here of a similar date. Yeah. But it's going to be a very big place. I mean, if, if it doesn't yes. survive today, to be a sort of major oh, sort yes. of country house, yes, absolutely. National Trust and visitors yeah, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Yes. And there is one more hint as to how grand Stoll's mansion was to have been, the gatehouse. Removed in the 19th century to another mansion and subsequently cut off from it by a bypass. The Stowell did say he wanted to have the best house and the best wife and the best horse in the west of England. Oh, right, right. Well, the house is pretty impressive. It certainly what is. the wife was like. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the story of Low Ham, and each church stood in the field. It didn't always stand alone, and in its heyday, it was an ornamental feature to great mansions in their grounds. And if you think of the Roman villa, then these fields have been home to at least three great mansions with their ornamental grounds around them, three pleasure domes. And the Cook family? They don't live in a stately home, they work hard in this landscape. But like its past inhabitants, they know how to use it for pleasure as well, with their annual steam rally. Lowham's hidden tradition of a landscape of pleasure lives on.